So this is this was an interesting uh, an interesting talk that took when I put it together. I've been doing the same talk web downline for about three years, four years, something like that. How long? How long? How many years have I done this talk? How many years ago? I think it's three or four. And the funny thing about this one this time was, I knew the conference was coming, and I'm like, man, I don't think I have anything to talk about. And it turns out this is the log the largest talk of them all. <laughs> so um, yeah, and it and. You know, give credit where credit is due. Uh, I wasn't working as much on VMM last year. I worked on it a lot, of course, but uh, pri in prior years, it was a lot of uh, the platform going up and making sure that everything was working properly and built solidly. And uh, this past year, I had a lot of uh, a lot of help from other folks building things on top of uh, the platform, which is actually pretty cool. So, um, without further ado, I got up to fifty-four slides to get through. <laughs> I promise I'll go fast. Uh, some of them are back up too. So again, like I always do, we'll talk about where we were a year ago, three weeks ago, uh, where we are now, future plans, and then uh, Q and A. So one year ago, uh, reasonably complete support for OpenBSD and Linux guests. Um, AMD sixty four and i three eighty six host support were in uh, SVM VMX support. Basically, everything just kind of worked. Um, there was of course warts and bugs and things that needed to get sorted out, but uh, fundamentally, it, it did what it was supposed to do. Uh, VMM and VMD that is. Uh, scaffolding and tools to support the above, so VMD, VMCTL, um, you know, that's how you uh, interface with, uh, with the hypervisor on OpenBSD. So all that stuff was already in there last year. So what did we do this year? Um, new and core features that we added, um, some, some, some new platform enhancements, some security improvements, and uh, other things. I'll talk about each of these in more detail. Uh, disk snapshotting and Q, uh, QCAL2 support uh, for the disks uh, in uh, VMD. Uh, template VMs, uh, which is the way to do a simple way of inheriting VM settings from a parent to a child. Uh, security improvements, a um, bunch of stuff that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And platform improvements, um, paying down technical debt and bug fixing, which I think every year in the what are we planning for this year slide, it always is let's do bug fixing. We actually were able to cut the number of bugs down last year, which I thought was pretty good. Not by much, because we reduced it by this much, and then this many new ones came. So, <laughs> um, also some community involvement, um, as we'll, we'll talk about later. And I think it's already been mentioned earlier. We have um, a uh, a group in Amsterdam doing commercial hosting of uh, OpenBSD uh, VMs on VMM. I think that's pretty cool. We have another example of um, somebody building a a new a new platform support on top of VMM without VMD uh, for running microkernels. Is actually pretty uh, interesting as well. So I'll talk about all of this through the next uh, well, so many minutes until I run through my 54 slides. 2016. 2016. So 16, 17, 18, 19, four years. So I'll talk about everything that we've that we've done. And the way that I put this slide deck together, the same way I do it most years, is I go through the commit history and I look and see what did we do in the last year. And that's good because you always forget about things that you've actually done. You go, oh, I forgot so and so did this, and I forgot so and so did that. As a matter of fact, uh, just an hour or so ago, Peter said you forgot to talk about something, which we'll now talk about because I forgot to look in a particular part of the tree. So some of these may not sound like really fantastically great improvements or really large scale, but they are important in in one way or another. So as I talk through these, some of these improvements may be some of these improvement um, commits may be new functionality, but some are just bug fixes. So in the platform improvements category that I just made up, um, we have some improved instruction emulation around um, some features that we announced support for in the hypervisor that didn't actually work properly or worked in a way that the guest VM wasn't expecting. And that usually typically just causes the guest VM to crash. Um, Claudio added support for QEMU's uh, firmware config interface. Now that doesn't mean we support QEMU as a replacement for VMD. But this allows uh, CBIOS, which is our, uh, our boot up BIOS, to pass uh, boot parameters into, uh, into the VM. We also support the debug registers now, which we didn't used to do, which would mean previously a guest VM that attempted to use this just simply wouldn't work and you couldn't do hardware breakpoints. Um, platform support for Pixie Boot. Hey. <laughs> uh, it seems like it's up here every year, and then, and then Philip comes back with it, and it doesn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got it nailed down now. I think I fixed this one for good, hopefully, after uh, EuroBSD comment. I'm not sure if it got committed. I have to look in my trees. And we implemented some missing functionality in some of our interrupt controller models, uh, some uh, way down in the weed stuff. 
So a couple of interesting instruction emulation fixes, and this is really more for the, the hypervisor author folks in the room. Um, we were advertising support for an instruction called RDTSCP, which is the read timestamp counter with the CPU uh, ID baked into it. Uh, that didn't quite work right, and because we said we supported it, SmartOS said, okay, we're going to go ahead and use that, and then it didn't work, and then SmartOS failed too. So we fixed that by simply saying we don't support RDTSCP. It's the easiest way to solve that problem. Uh, similarly, we had uh, we there's two instructions for doing uh, memory range monitoring, and this is typically used in operating system idle loops, uh, monitor and M weight, and there's a new enhanced version of this called monitor X, and we said forever in our CPU ID uh, report back to the guest VM that we didn't support monitor, and then you had Ryzen that came along and said, well, what about monitor X, and we weren't filtering that out, so that broke booting on Linux on Ryzen hosts. These are mainly bug fixes. But um, try to jump on these as quickly as I can as I record. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have support for the firmware config interface in QMU, which basically allows CBIOS to do some parameter handoff. Uh, that is probably going to be enhanced moving forward to support different kinds of debug units, which we'll talk about earlier, or we talked about earlier. Uh, support for debug registers allows the hardware breakpoint usage inside of the guest VM. Um, we don't actually use debug registers in OpenBSD, and we don't allow any program to use them. Uh, this was a subject of a security security vulnerability affecting some other operating systems last year. Uh, we don't we don't do this, but we do now allow the guest VM to use them. We just we preserve them uh, across the entry and exit for uh, VM transitions. So that should work now. Um, platform support for Pixie Boot. I thought I had it last year. I claimed I had it last year and then didn't work. Um, then at EuroBSDCon last uh, it was October September October. Uh, someone pointed out that it didn't work, so I think we've got that all nailed down. It does require a, a ROM image extension, which I think we'll end up baking this into our VMR firmware blob. Um, should be easily found. It's just a big concatenation of a bunch of binary files. Uh, if you want to do network boot, we already have a different way to do this through the dash capital B option to VMCTL, which we'll talk about later. And uh, there's some missing interrupt controller functionality. There's basically bug fixes. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can talk to me later or just go through, through the commit history. In the category that I'll call correctness improvements, uh, which is really just we were lying to VMs, uh, many fixes in CPU ID emulation. Uh, we basically had it fairly well wrong last time, uh, last time we spoke, last year. Uh, so we fixed up all that. Add supports for older CPUs without X save. That was just a bug that was reported by somebody using VMM on a really old CPU that didn't have that capability. X save is used for saving a floating point state. Um, over the years, as I've gone through other hypervisor code and the Intel SDM, I've been tossing items into my to do list that say basically, oh, you should read up on this particular thing or that particular thing that you might need to fix someday. So last year was the year of going through the list and cleaning up the stuff. And this last item talks about that. Um, there are certain SMM-related MSRs. Does anybody know what SMM is? System management mode. That is a mode of operation where a piece of firmware can take over the machine, pull it into a special mode of operation to do things like um, um, emulating uh, hardware devices and whatnot. Um, there are certain MSRs, model-specific registers, that are only useful inside SMM. And they're required to actually cause particular faulting behavior uh, if you if you attempt to use them outside SMM. So although previously we would just handle this by throwing the, the request away, uh, that's technically not accurate and that's not correct from the, the manual's perspective, so we fixed that up as well. Um, CPU ID improvement I mentioned before, we had a bunch of it wrong. Um, we were misreporting large leaf function numbers. So basically, if somebody passed in a request for CPU ID leaf function number 50 million, it would just report back some random garbage, which didn't actually, wasn't actually good. We now have proper topology reporting. Uh, so what this means is there's a CPU function that you can, CPU ID function you can request that says, tell me how many packages and cores and hypergrids I have. And we were reporting back whatever the host has. So on my machine that has 48 cores at home, report back that you're a 48 core machine. And VMM has a single CPU. <laughs> all, the, all VMs have a single CPU. So that was really odd. Um, that broke Golang apps, by the way. Because Golang would, would, would spawn up a bunch of Go, uh, 
the go routines, I guess it was called go routines, to match the number of physical CPUs you had. That was broken. Um, this is a bizarre one. CPU ID is a function that doesn't take any size arguments. It always operates on 32-bit values. It takes a 32-bit input and gives you four 32-bit outputs, but Kekel OS, for those of you who know what that is. <laughs> what is that? You, so we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> 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 uses, uses, uses an, instru an instruction size extension on the front of CPU ID, which is really weird. So if you look at like the, uh, the reason that was causing a problem is it would actually crash the, it would crash the guest because um, uh, it would report back that the CPU ID instruction length was not what we were expecting. So anyway, a bunch of these bizarre corner cases. We're finally, we're finally getting to the point where the platform's stable enough where we can start cleaning up this mess. Uh, no, Temple OS still does not work. Uh, you can Google that. <laughs> it's an it's a interesting side topic for a beer later. Um, some of you may, may have also noticed that um, back in January, I, it, on OpenBSD, not related to hypervisors or VMs at all, I increased the amount of physical memory limits for an OpenBSD machine. We were previously supported up to 512 gigs of physical memory on an OpenBSD host. That has now been extended to two terabytes, and is, you just crank a knob now to get it as high as you want. But one thing I noticed is as I was teaching my virtualization class, uh, we were talking about physical address sizes in, uh, in one of the lectures, and it I, of course, used VMM as the demonstration, and I said, look, this machine has a very large physical address range, one that I was testing on, and I reported back that it was much smaller, so actually demoing this in front of a live audience ended up showing that there was a bug there. So we properly now report the physical address limits for the host CPU, and this allows uh, VMs with much larger memory, which I'll um, maybe just show you real quick and we'll have a chance at the end. Uh, I've talked about this already, so I'll skip through this just real quick. We now support CPUs without X save. Older CPUs don't have this. That's a, a floating point function that actually wouldn't even need this anymore at all. And then the SMM related MSRs. So the reference guide says that these should pound GP, which is a general protection violation on use. And we previously ignored these or just returned zero. Uh, that was not the correct behavior. So the previous behavior was harmless, but we didn't actually do it correctly. Um, another big improvement since last year, uh, going through the commit history, um, early last year, or I should say very soon after the previous BeehiveCon, uh, we had uh, a bunch of problems reported on SVM, which is the uh, AMD uh, hardware extension, hardware virtualization extensions. And we improved that significantly last year. Um, interrupt window handling was totally broken before, and that was fixed. Does anybody know what interrupt windows are? Interrupt windows are... Um, a situation where your, your virtual hardware that you're emulating, your virtual disk controller or your virtual network card or graphics card or whatever, um, as it's generating interrupts, you have to know when you can in safely inject those into the VM. And you can't inject those into the VM while the VM has interrupts disabled. Otherwise, the guest, behave, guest VM goes crazy and goes belly up. So what interrupt window handling lets you do is it says, it tells the CPU that, hey, whenever you're ready for an interrupt, let me know. And then I can turn around and inject an interrupt. So basically, you don't have to sit there and continually pull for the interrupt flag to turn uh, clear, uh, so or to turn set. So interrupt window handling was broken. And what that really meant on SVM last year is it was just really, really slow, uh, really, really awfully. So like one tenth the, the the performance that it should be. Um, so these two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, interrupt window handling was broken, and the interrupt had uh, interruptflags.io handling was totally broken before. So both those have been fixed. Um, the other thing that we would do on SVM is we would lock and unlock the kernel lock up to four times during exit processing. So as the VM would do something that would trigger an exit to the hypervisor, uh, we would go in and we would lock the kernel lock for a small piece of code, then unlock it, then lock it again, then unlock it, then lock it again. And for those who know OpenBSD, we still have a, a substantial amount of our kernel locked with the, the kernel lock. So what that does is it slows down the VM, slows down VMD, and slows down the rest of the system. So now this model follows much more closely the Intel model that we have in VMM, where we only lock it right at the beginning and right at the end. So lock it at the beginning and unlock it at the end. Um, middle of summer last year, um, I was reading through some of the KVM mailing lists, and there was a bug in KVM that uh, said that you, they don't actually check the VMX instructions so as you're building a hypervisor, there's a bunch of VMX-related instructions that you can use to launch a VM, 
or to uh, load some uh, load the current uh, the currently executing uh, VM onto the CPU or the VM control structure onto the CPU and so on. And the interesting thing about these instructions are if you run them inside a VM, which really implies that you're trying to do nested virtualization, uh, the processor will always make an exit to the hypervisor before checking the privilege level. So if you make a, a, a user mode program with one line of code in it, it just simply has VM launch or VMX on or VMX off. What would end up happening is you would exit to the hypervisor and if the hypervisor wasn't expecting that instruction like we weren't at the time, uh, we would just terminate the VM. So what this simply meant is that a guest, via, a guest user could terminate their own VM from user mode. So that was not good. And that was actually uh, inspired by a KVM bug. So KVM also had the same issue. Um, uh, they had had the issue for a while, but in fact, that subsequently got fixed. I don't know when that was fixed. Maybe in last year, maybe earlier. Um, but yeah, that was something that needed to get resolved. You probably need to do this on AMD as well. I have to go look at what the exit semantics are for the AMD um, VM functions. Um, cleaned up some handling of control register bits. Um, so previously what we would do is we would say, if you tried to set invalid bits, we would just terminate you. And this kind of philosophy goes back to when we first built VMM. Basically what I was doing is I was stubbing out the code. I would say, if there's anything unexpected whatsoever, we just kill the guest. It's kind of, you know, fail closed. Now we're getting to the point, as I mentioned, that we have enough bandwidth and time and the platform is subsequently built out that we can actually go back and actually do the correct thing here, which is really just a GP, a general protection violation. So we can now treat the, the guest the way that it might expect to be treated. Now, most likely what's going to happen here is the guest will just die anyway, but at least we're doing it the proper way now. And that's what I just mentioned. AMD improvements replaced the terminate the guest with functionality appropriate for the case. So the terminate the guest on anything unexpected was a remnant from early development, and we can now start to clean up these conditions. Um, so this is some security improvements. We removed lazy floating point handling as part of the larger operating system wide effort. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that uh, from last year. Uh, basically, most operating systems had to remove lazy floating point handling due to the CPU vulnerability. So that was cleaned up out of uh, VMM as part of that, that wider effort. And then there was the L1 terminal fault bug last August. Um, anyone know about that one? Fun, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's 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 pretty crazy. Um, for the rest of you, the other than the one person who knows what L one TF is or maybe you don't want to admit to knowing what it is. Um, the L1 TF, the L1 terminal fault vulnerability or bug in the CPU, it allows, basically allows a reading of the data that's in L1, the L1 cache. Now, that in and of itself is not good, um, because anybody can, if I just said allows the read of data in the L1 cache from any context, that would be bad. But this, this next piece is really bad. Um, the processor treats EPT addresses as real addresses. So if I'm a guest VM, I can program in a physical address into my um, uh, into my table and read basically anything I want from the host. So that's not good. Um, yeah, oops. So um, now what you have to do when you enter the VM, basically what you don't want you don't want to happen is you don't want the VM to be able to read data that came from the host or from another previous context. So as you enter the VM, you have to flush everything out of L1 then enter the guest, do whatever you want to do, and then figure it out later. But the problem is, well, how do you actually flush this? There's no instruction that says flush the L1 cache. There's an instruction that says flush everything, but that's not very good. It's not very performant. And by the way, it was never really clearly specified. Is this only L1 data? Or is there an L1 instruction cache to L1 data leakage too, which there are in other CPUs? So what, what do you have to flush? It's not clear. So the answer that we found out, of course, after the fact was um, there's a new microcode available that you can load into your CPU. Basically, there's a command MSR that says flush the L1 whatever. Well, what if you don't have that new microcode? If you don't want to load it, or if your files vendor doesn't support it, if you have no way to load it in. So how do you, conceptually, how do you flush it? How do you flush a cache? 
Well, you filled the cache up with data that you don't care about, right? <laughs> so if you don't have the new microcode, what we have to do, and we detect if you have the new microcode or not, or if you have the capability or not. So in our entry path now, if you don't have the new microcode, you read a bunch of junk, you hopefully fill all of the L1 data with what you've read, and we, we got this from a number of, we, we, we sourced this approach from a, a couple of various places. Um, but one thing that it didn't look like anybody else was doing is, okay, so you flushed all this out of the cache, but you generally can't immediately do a VM launch after that because you're gonna have to do some cleanup of the variables you wanna load because in your loop to read the, to flush the junk, to, in your loop to read all the junk, You've used some registers that you have to replace with ones for the guest. So then, how do you, how do you, what about those cache lines that you've now touched? So those now get loaded into the cache. So there's, there's this extra piece that I think we do that, that other, other OSs don't, or at least didn't when we fixed this. Maybe they do now. And then again, what about, what about the instruction cache? So how, what do you do here? So what junk do you read? Well, our junk consists of 64k of 0x CCs. What's a CC on Intel? It's an in, it's an in three breakpoint, yeah. <laughs> so because we don't know, because no one's told us, if there's any L1 data to L1 uh, instruction cache leakage, we just read a whole bunch of CC into the cache. So even if there is instruction leak uh, leakage in the cache in that direction, you'll just end up executing or reading into uh, a breakpoint. Yeah. And again, nobody's told us anything. We've asked, and the answer is crickets. Um, I want to give a, a thanks to Maxine from NetBSD who pointed out a couple of other bugs. Um, we had a, a couple of bugs in Xset BV, which is another floating point related, uh, another floating point related instruction that we were handling it incorrectly. Um, so we changed this and made it how we handle a different instruction that, that forces it to, uh, to, to go to the proper, properly implemented. So thanks uh, to Maxine for helping us out with that, pointing that out to us. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the summary of what we've changed in VMM, which is the kernel side of the hypervisor. And that's all interesting stuff to talk about and um, uh, important. But most of the, the more impactful improvements, I think, came in VMD and VMCTL uh, last year, uh, specifically support for QCOW2 disks, uh, disk snapshots, template VMs, and more user-friendly uh, VMCTL options to help managing VMs a little bit easier for end users. So um, toward the end of the summer last year, we got support for QCOW2 disks, supported in either standalone mode or base plus snapshot mode, and I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Uh, support for that was integrated both into VMCTL and VMD. Uh, the old raw or blank, uh, just linear format, is still supported, of course. Both of these modes are sparse, but QCOW2 is lazily allocated, and that will become clear what I mean by that um, uh, on the next slide or two. So we have two disk formats that we can support now. So the way that you use this uh, is through VMCTL, of course, to first create the disk. You can use any QCOW2 creator you want. You can use QEMUs if you want, but we built this into VMCTL as well. So for example, I can create foo.raw 10 gig and foo.qcow2 10 gig. And then if I look at what I have here, I have QCOW2, which is really tiny on disk, and then I have foo.raw, which looks to be really big on disk but it's actually still sparse. So what this means is although it looks like it's a 10 gig file, it only consumes like a couple hundred K bytes on disk. So this would be useful for times when you have to actually transfer something like this over the network through like SCP or something, whereas this still retains its sparseness with a regular copy or a move across file systems that support that kind of feature. You can also convert disks. So following on the previous example, I can create a raw disk from a QCOW2 disk, and that does a convert. So I started with this, and then I created foo2. And if you notice what happened here, of course, it expanded out to be the size that it was supposed to be. But the way that we did this, of course, is to preserve the sparseness. So if you look at a DU on each of these, they all consume almost 192k. So if you copy this again around uh, file systems that support, I think NFS does, uh, it'll only copy the, the bytes that the bytes that actually need to be copied. It still scans the whole file to determine where the holes are, at least in the case of the raw format, but you end up uh, on the other side only consuming a small amount of space. And again, QCOW2 is just a, a lazily allocated one, so it'll just grow and grow and grow. Um, 
So you can, of course, launch a regular VM um, using that QCAL2 disk or the raw disk as your disk. That's normal. So you would do VMCTL start dash D, either of these. But the more interesting thing is, let's say that you had a, a QCAL2 base disk and you installed a VM and set it up and you wanted to make a clone or make a derived disk out of it or just experiment with something and throw away the results afterwards. What you can do is you can create a derived disk whose size is equal to the original disk because they have to match. And here's the base. So what this does is it creates a derived disk and then if you use this disk as your disk in your VM, all the changes will accumulate here, none from here. And if there's a block missing out of this layer, it'll pull it up on this one. Uh, you want to, and it's basically what I just mentioned. Um, all the all the all the changes accumulate in the upper layer, and if you want to roll back, you will just simply roll back. You just delete the original one and restore an original. You re, you delete the one you changed and restore a previous one, or just recreate it again. Um, here's an option out there for the for the world that's listening. It would be nice to have roll back and roll forward via new VMCTL option. Any takers. <laughs> That should be a fairly easy way to get involved with a, pro with a project if you want something new that's small and bite-sized. It's not that, probably not that big. Is there any way of merging the raw? So merging it? So yeah, so in that way you can delete one. Like you want to you want to move forward, so use your derived. Yeah, it'd be like roll forward, right? Yeah. yeah roll forward, and, and when it has to be cloned, and then you want to promote the clone. Yeah, I don't think there's a merge. That'd probably be easy too, though. Just read, you read the derived, and if it's if it's block isn't in the derived, you get it from the base, and the output is a flattened one, maybe. I don't. I, I as far as I know, we don't support merge. I could be wrong though. So that's just been changing a lot over the last few months. So I was surprised that we had as much as we did. Actually, I wonder <laughs> how we do this too. <laughs> cool. Any questions on this? A couple new options. Some of these have already been discussed in previous talks. Um, we now have the ability to do a dash capital B option to VMCTL start, and the XXX would be the boot device. Now, right now, that's just net for the moment, but it's fairly easily done to uh, extend that out and have other kinds of boot options. This is really for OpenBSD guests. Uh, it allows the, uh, the, inst the install boot media to detect that it should boot off of the network by setting the appropriate boot device. Uh, so it's useful for auto-installing guest VMs via network, and I think this is what you guys were using it for, you Claudio, I looked. Um, we also added in some support in OpenBSD base to automatically manage starting and stopping of VMs when you, when you bring the machine up and shut it down. So to facilitate that, uh, we added a VMCTL stop minus A. That just simply says stop all VMs. We didn't have that before. We had to stop them all one at a time. And we also have stop minus F, which is basically the terminate option. Uh, to a VM, and that does not wait for the VMM control interface uh, to wait for the VM to be properly shut down. So if you really want something to be stopped, you can stop minus F it. Template VMs were a new addition also last year, so we have a VMCTL start minus T option, and basically what that says is, is take an existing VM, clone all of its parameters except the disk and the network. So if you have a memory, uh, if you have a memory configuration, or CD-ROM configuration, or switch configuration, or anything like that. Um, uh, the I'm sorry, network works. Network is inherited, but the LL ladder obviously is not, which is the MAC address and the interface name as well. So basically, what this does is it says if I want to create a stands at vmctl.conf that allows me to create a, a template, I can simply manufacture 100 VMs really quickly this way uh, with with just changing uh, just changing the, the variable parameters. Um, so some miscellaneous improvements or changes. I don't know how you want to, I don't know if this one is an improvement or not. <laughs> uh, we finally got rid of i386 hosts. Um, that had served its purpose during early development. Uh, we found a lot of bugs, fixed a lot of things with it. It wasn't really worth maintaining anymore. It was broken for about two months and nobody complained, so we just got rid of it. Um, of course, i386 guests still work, so that's important to note because when we when we removed the i386 code, we had about 20 people at least personally to me send email saying, what am I going to do now? I have my i386 guests aren't going to work. No, no, that's not true. i386 hosts are the ones that don't work anymore. Code's available in the attic if anybody wants to go resurrect it and make it work again. All right, so that's kind of the wrap-up of what we did last year. 
So we'll talk about a little bit about what I'd like to do moving forward personally and kind of as the, the driver of, of, of BMM this year. Uh, we did pretty well reducing the bug count in 2018. Um, we have fewer bugs now than we did in 2018, this time last year, which is good, but there are still many. Um, I like, uh, of course, to solicit more community involvement. Um, we had a lot more people contribute to BMM last year than we did even the previous year, and it seems like it's popping up in places that I'm always interested, I'm always surprised to see. Um, I did not know that until uh, three or four months ago that Mastodon was running on it. Didn't also know that Undeadly's running on it. Oh, yeah. Undeadly's oh, yeah. running on it. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> um, I think, personally, I've done just about everything else interesting for me, so I'm probably just going to shift into the S&P mode now, um, because that's we, we intentionally drug our feet there for a long time to make sure that everything was working the way it should work, so S&P is my kind of personal goal. Um, there's a few things we have to do first, but it shouldn't be too bad um, to get that working. Um, of course, everybody else that wants to work on other things is welcome to contribute whatever they think is interesting. Um, so talking about some new ideas for BMF moving forward. What are we going to be doing this year with relation to things that are up on the, on the board? For those who were here last year, I talked about a concept um, called the underjack, which was a way to do uh, execute-only memory for the host. So I'd like to bring that one back and talk a little bit about more kind of what we did with that. Because um, when I talked about it last year, everybody was really excited, and it kind of went, well, what happened to it? So what happened to it um, I'll rewind a second. I'll talk about what happened to it in a minute. Um, last year we talked about the underjack. For those who weren't here, what this really means is you start up the OpenBSD kernel with VMM inside, and you pause the host, and you take VMM and you put it underneath the host itself. And what this ends up doing is it runs the host as a VM. This is not a new technique. This has been around a long, long time, uh, these kinds of ideas. But really the big benefit here is, it, is that it allows execute-only memory. And execute-only memory is a good defense against ROP attacks. And if you don't know what ROP attacks are, go see Todd Mortimer's talk this week. He's going to talk about ROP attacks and specifically about RedGuard. That's a different kind of defense. Um, these together would be a really, really powerful combination. Um, alone, each of them is also still pretty powerful. Um, but the idea behind the underjack is that you make, um, you make this kind of attack really, really, really substantially hard. So we talked about this last time. I showed a quick demo of how that works. And where were we? Well, the kernel part is working. That was completed last week, I thought. That's what I showed. Um, we're still faced with the problem of now you have the host running as, a, running as a VM with a thin hypervisor underneath it that really only knows how to do memory protection. So if you're running that, then now how do you take this and then run VMs in that? So basically, how do you retain compatibility with VMM? So that becomes an issue. Well. How do you handle running VMs inside another VM? Michael, Michael's, fa Michael's favorite topic. Yeah, yeah. Make it hard to work through. Yeah. yeah. There's two approaches. Um, the first is okay, the host or root partition approach. This is similar to how Microsoft does things uh, in the new version of Windows Server. It's very conceptually like this. What we can do is we can treat the host machine as a VM until a new VM is being launched. And what we do then is we temporarily take the host out of VM mode, enter the guest as usual, and then re-enter the host context. Basically what you're doing is you're swapping between the host VM and the guest VM over and over and over again. Um, so basically what this means is that these two VMs are essentially peers of each other. They can't read or write each other's memory, of course. But what this does is it, it, it's easier to implement, but it makes it more difficult to support nested execute-only scenarios. So if you have an OpenBSD, OpenBSD guest VM, or even a Linux guest VM, I guess, if you wanted to implement that. It would be difficult to put the execute-only support underneath that. So you would really only have execute-only execute only, um, protection for the host. So that's one approach. Second approach, of course, is just true nested virtualization. You never leave VMX mode. The host launches VMs of its own. The host VM becomes the nested hypervisor. You can just pass through the nested uh, the nested execute only bits because the guest VM would be allowed to set whatever information it wanted. The first approach is easier to code. The second approach allows for arbitrary levels of nesting. So, which one do you do, right? What's the state of hardware assisting for pseudo nesting or real nesting? 
Glad you asked. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had a nested virtualization tree for a long time. Um, it's been in various states of rotting and not over time. Um, what we have right now is a nested VMX support that does what's what I'm calling an emulated VMCS. Um, before I go any further, does any does it who knows what a VMCS is? One, two, three, four, five. Enough people. Should I take five minutes and talk about what VMCS is? Absolutely. Not. Okay. So I'm gonna do this. Fast forward to the <laughs> bonus slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a VMCS stands for Virtual, virtual Machine Control Structure. Um, AMD calls it a VMCB, but it's the same idea. Um, it's a data structure in memory, and it stores guest and host register state and control fields. Now, in the case of Intel, this data structure is not a structure like you'd see in C. You don't just do struct dot field or struct pointer field. You don't do it this way. It's, it's what's called an index data structure. So basically what you do is you issue an instruction that says, please read from this particular field index, the value that I want. Um, this is common in other CPU architectures, but this is the only thing in the Intel side of things that, or the Intel ecosystem that uses this kind of thing, uses this kind of approach. Um, the VMCS is a very heavily contended uh, used data structure. It's used all the time. Tons and tons of VM reads and VM writes are getting data into and out of the VMCS over and over and over again, lots and lots of times per second. So if the guest VM is running, just forget about nesting for a moment. Um, if a VM is running an exit of any kind, a halt, an interrupt, an IO operation, a memory operation, whatever, it's going to involve uh, typically a few dozen, in our case, VM reads. So basically what I'm doing is I'm reading a bunch of data out of this data structure memory to determine what the guest VM was doing at the time of the exit. Now, in the case of a nested virtualization scenario, I have my base hypervisor and my hypervisor on top with my VM inside it. This, all of these exits, all of these reads are also themselves causing exits down to the host. So what you have is a, is a compounding of these exit, uh, of these, the number of exits. When I'm done processing the exit, I write all my data back to the guest state if I've done any instruction emulation. And again, in the nested scenario, all of each of these cause their own exits. Also keep in mind that accessing the data in the data structure will all, all, almost always involve a trip through the nested paging facility. So all of my VM reads and VM writes go through a table lookup, which then do a nested write or a nested read. And basically what you have is this, this multiplicative effect of all of these exits that occur. Now an exit is a very um, heavyweight operation in, in the hypervisor. It takes a lot of time to, to, uh, to process them. So suddenly now a single exit potentially causes hundreds of cascaded exits, and it makes things really slow. So to alleviate this problem is, uh, it, uh, Intel came up with this thing called shadow VMCSs. I think they're in Haswell or maybe Broadwell or later. So it requires a relatively more recent CPU, 2013, 2014 timeframe or, or newer. And what this basically says is that there is a VMCS hiding behind the real one, or hiding in front of the real one, I guess. And what this says is the guest VM can read and write whatever it wants, I don't care. Let it do whatever it wants to do. I set some fields in there that I care about, but other than that, I just let it fill in this data. And I can promote a shadow VMCS to a real one by flipping this, uh, the, the, this pointer back and forth. What this does is it reduces ex exit traffic, improves performance, but it has the, the downside of what? Right. So, when I first started this, because I mentioned I've had this in my tree for a long time, I didn't have a Haswell. As a matter of fact, this machine, which is my primary machine, isn't even a Haswell. So what I have in my tree is, is a, essentially an emulated version of Shadow VMCS. So it has, uh, each read and write must be emulated separately. So every field that gets written to or read from has an individual function that implements the read or write functionality for it and it ends up just being really, really slow. So now that you guys know about what VMCSs are. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll probably continue down the path of the emulated mode for now until I decide that I've had enough, and then I might just throw in the towel and say you have to have a Haswell or a Broadwell or neither. And I guess what that means is that you won't actually uh, be able to run nested VMs on anything that's old. Maybe that's okay. 
Yeah. Um, I can I can boot boots in quotes. <laughs> I can boot nested uh, nested guests. Um, it's really slow. Um, there's a few instructions I can't handle yet. So Linux crashes pretty early in the boot sequence now with the emulated mode. The VM VMM on top of VMM seems to be a little bit better, but it's really really slow. It's almost it's almost better to actually just run QEMU inside the VM at this point because there's so much traffic going on in the VM space. Yeah. We'll fix that though. That, that'll get cleaned up. That's not a problem. Um, probably, at, again, at some point, need to be redone to use shadow VMCSs. Um, the other issue with using the emulated approach is running a 32-bit hypervisor um, is really messed up. It's, it's hard. It's a lot harder. Um, and, that's, and that's actually probably because of something I brought on my own, my own myself. Because the VMCS fields are split into two 32-bit pieces for the 64-bit fields in, um, uh, in that mode. And again, maybe we just maybe we just don't care about trying to support these old these old hosts and well, thirty two bit hypervisor guests. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Maybe we don't care. I, I don't know. Um, again, this is all new stuff. This is what we've been working on for a while. This is the tree I always go back to when I get fed up with what I'm currently working on. So when I get bored or fed up with SMP, I'll fall back to do some more of this. Okay. So that's enough about nesting. Um, something else that's not committed yet, but probably will be committed pretty soon, is PD clock. Uh, it's a paravirtualized clock. It's modeled after KVM's PD clock. Uh, hopefully, this will help time skews and uh, high CPU usage uh, applications doing a lot of get time of day or equivalent. Um, Reich uh, and and Pratik did most of this work. Um, Reich was pointing out that in the JVM, it just sits there in a loop and does all kinds of get time of days just in a repeated loop. And on Linux, that's just I think it's just the VDSO read. Uh, on uh, in in our case, that's a trip back out to VMD and multiple exits to handle this. So he said that this helps a lot. And we'll, hopefully, we'll get this in pretty soon. I think yeah. it's because yeah. um, it's kind of different from Bishop from uh, OpenSUSE of Amsterdam. Uh, what's the name of the Is he working this? Is he using this? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we've had problems with that forever. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, counter wraparound problem. So speaking of OpenSD Amsterdam, thanks for the segue. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just a few minutes, I'd like to point out a few things going on in the community. Uh, as as uh, Philip was saying, uh, Misha is running uh, OpenBSD Amsterdam, uh, running hosted VMs, on, hosted OpenBSD VMs on um, on VMR. And um, I'd like to thank him because part of the fee that he charges is donated to the OpenBSD Foundation. So that's that's great. That's good news as well. Um, as of yesterday. 238 VMs deployed since last year across seven servers. I think it's donated what 2,000 to others or something, yeah. right? something like that. Yeah, it's quite a, quite a not an insignificant amount. Um, and he keeps adding new servers as he fills them up. Um, uh, if you're interested, uh, there's a Beehive referral and discount code for five euros off. If you want to uh, if you want to get a VM from them, uh, a, a VMM VM, and uh, you can upgrade you can upgrade to larger memory or more disk for extra for extra money. But uh, uh, I, this has been a really good, uh, a really good asset test of, of, of the platform because it's running a, you know, a, 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 not a not insignificant amount of VMs um, uh, across uh, across a bunch of servers. And I think uh, hopefully it'll be a, a, a real BSD project. So the, um, so the sort of I don't know. Does he? You guys know? I mean, on the host side or on the yeah, on the host side because obviously you're going to have outages and redirects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An outage. I I, I think uh, it's like yeah, yeah everybody, there's going to be an outage. <laughs> yeah, I think it's. I don't uh, think it's about that. Yeah. Yep. 
Put the one down for a half an hour. Also, um, Solo 5 and Mirage Unikernels are um, supported on top, running on top of VMM. Um, it's been a pillar from the community. Uh, Adam's been working on this uh, as well for a while, and um, that has been getting better and better. And you know, we're actually I was working with him over the Christmas break on a, an improvement to um, our uh, our memory protection model, where they can call into VMM for um, setting individual protections on the nested page table. So. Um, that's really cool. Um, I'd love to see more integrations like that. Um, these are the kinds of things that appear in your inbox and you go, wow, I didn't know people were working on this kind of thing. So, so I thought that was worth pointing out. All right. 45 minutes, 54 slides. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any questions? Well, if there's any, yeah. Just one right now, just one at the top. So you mean the multiple layers? Yeah. yeah, just only one derived. Probably should be pretty easy to add support for more if we wanted to, but right now it's just it's just only one. Um, yes, cool. Is there any support for various operating systems, or is it just separate like updates? Um, FreeBSD and NetBSD still have the, the in-out console problem we have forever. Well. We don't support the comp mode of console I that is being done. Um, NetBSD is actually pretty easy to get working on. Um, we never wait for any of the code because there's a there's a particular function that we need um, that basically everybody who built a hypervisor got it wrong the first time. And I want to make sure that we don't get it wrong because it can lead to huge problems and security holes and all kinds of other issues. So I've been taking my time making sure that that's absolutely correct. And I'm not saying that we put it in, it's not going to be right, it's not going to be wrong, um, has to do with the memory decoding. And basically everyone has, has had problems with that. Um, once that's done, then the, the console should work very easily on NetBSD. I think if you if you had a some kind of a headless NetBSD system, it might work with like no console. Um, and that might be okay. Um, FreeBSD will also, it has the same kind of issue, but it also, in um, AMD64 requires a kernel parameter, actually requires a kernel being rebuilt because FreeBSD expects a local IP address, which is not unreasonable because basically every machine after like 1998 has one. <laughs> so um, you have to build it using the old legacy address, right? And then that, then that works once you get the console working. So, um, so those would be the kind of the next two on the horizon. After that, um, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to do Windows, you need a bunch more stuff. Then you, then we have a decision to make. Do we build the Helium rollout or do we try to build all these different devices? Yeah, that's where all kind of what makes the game sound graphics and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Once once you've got the plans, yeah. Then you don't like the game really. Yeah. Um, there are some crazy things that I, if I ever say that we want to do Windows, I want to make sure that we have nested them first, and that, that may sound weird. Like, why do you need nested virtualization for Windows? Well, it's because the, the, the direction and the velocity, the direction Microsoft is going and the velocity behind what, what they're doing, they're shifting everything into a, um, into a virtualized model. Um, CSRSS, and LSAS, and all the other Windows components, I think that are critical importance are now running in their own partitions. Um, so you'll be able to run Windows in a non-virtual way, but it'll be substantially less secure, and that certainly is not what they recommend. So I would like to get, I would like to get the nested stuff done first, and, and working reasonably in a performant way. Um, I don't want it to work at 10% of the models because that would be kind of stupid. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, but there's, you know, it's an iterative approach. Um, I'm always looking for people that can help out with some of these little pieces that need to be built. Um, the good news is the pieces are all there. They're all open source, you can go look at them. Um, uh, but it's trying to find people that are interested and in the right direction, they're just going to fall off the cliff after a week. <laughs> Which I, that's, that's discouraging for, for them, I suppose. Um, another question. Um, the fast, fast ops is good. It's like, it, it's good to ask for reliable ops, but um, what is happening uh, from the kind of BSD perspective to give VMM to the next generation? Of ops is like, you know, snapshots, 
I'm not really involved in that. <laughs> um, that's a that's a you know that's the old day sucker. He volunteered. He raised his hand. But more to the point, nobody's working on this. <laughs> we know that it's going to be the puzzle piece to bring this. Yeah, I, not I, I think that's a I think that that's a recurring that's a recurring question every year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's, your, what's your file system story? Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, we have we have one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still just growing. The VMs are growing at the size of all the thing. If you've got a very active VM, then the file system might be very active as well. And then if you had some instability in hardware, it's all over. Yeah, I, I could I could rightly claim I'm not a file system person. <laughs> file system that we have works for me. Um, until it gets right in my face as being horribly, yeah. Until it doesn't, then, then, then I, I personally have other things I'd like to work on. So, I'm not, and, and again, that's that's in no way discounting the fact that yes, I should probably work on other things. All right. Question from the chat room. Yep. What meaningful collaboration has there been between the OpenBSD VM and other hypervisors? We have some great examples here that I just don't have really of late, but you've seen some just demonstrate. Yeah, I mean, code exchange? well, code exchange between hypervisors is going to probably be pretty tough. I mean, uh, you can you can read code and like gain inspiration from what other people did. Um, um, I I've been in email correspondence with Maxine over a number of issues over the past year, year and a half. Um, um, yeah, I think that's, I don't know if other people are doing other things, but that's what. Okay, that's yeah, that's what I see. Cool. Other questions? Wrapping up. Maybe. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't hear it. <laughs> well, thank you. All right.